So, in fact, I am not actually going to be talking about any design work here today at all. And certainly none of my design work. Um, there's another piece of what, that underlay a lot of the work that I was doing when I was at the Media Lab and, and since, which is I've been very interested in questions around the evolution of communication. Um, it started with a course that I took as a grad student that looked at the evolution of communication and I started looking at something called signaling theory, which was about how um, honesty and deception co-evolve. And there's, um, I'll be talking about a little introduction to what signaling theory is, but basically it's a way of, of looking at how communication functions, given how profitable it can be to lie. And what's interesting to me is when you look at this, I think we're actually at a very interesting inflection point in the sort of evolution of deception in that technology really is making things quite different. Um, there are some ways in which it's making deception much harder. You know, there's surveillance. A lot of you now realize that you have a whole digital footprint that makes really reinventing yourselves very different than it was even a generation ago when people could go off to college and completely forget everything about who they were as high school students. But in other ways, technology makes deception um, easier. There's, you know, a lot of you know, since the beginning of any kind of online forum, there's been all these complaints that people were playing around with their identity, et cetera. The piece of it I'm going to look at, be talking about today mostly, is the rise of social robots, um, online software agents, all kinds of things and entities that converse with us in ways that, while we know that at heart they are not sentient beings or intelligent beings or loving beings, give us the impression that they are all of these things. And what does this mean in terms of our interactions with them? How do we want to design them? Um, and what sort of things do we think are legitimate or non-legitimate ways of doing this? So we're going to start by talking a little bit about signaling theory and how deception has evolved. Um, this is a gazelle who is doing something called stotting. And it's, um, it's an interesting behavior, like, because what, this is a way that gazelles respond to seeing some kinds of predators. That instead, their gazelles are super fast, but instead of running off when they see what's called a coursing predator, so like dogs and, and um, wild dogs and other kinds of predators that try and outrun them, the fastest gazelles, the slow gazelles actually do run off, but the fast ones just jump up and down um, in place. And what's interesting is the dogs don't run after the ones that are doing that in general. And it's a form of honest communication that says, um, or that what the interpretation through signaling theory is that it's a way of saying, I am so fast that I have time to waste. If I was a slower gazelle, I would really have to run because if you happen to go after me while I was doing this, I would have to take off. Running, the reason that this is better than just run, you might think, well, why don't they just run if they're so fast, is if running is still more dangerous, it takes up more energy than jumping up and down like this does for the gazelles. And you're also more likely to injure yourself. Like if you're a gazelle and running very fast, they're more likely to you know, hurt their leg or, or have some kind of injury. So this is a safer thing, but obviously if you were slow and a dog went after you, it could pull you down. So they have to be able to still take off really fast if they need to. So the idea is that this evolved as a way of communicating honestly between adversaries because part of it is since there are still are occasions when the dogs will test this, um, a gazelle who is being dishonest, who is slow and still tied to spring up and down like this. Um, and some of it, sometimes they, they do see this where one is a little bit slower, it will get eaten. So it's a way that they have to be um, honest enough in their communication. Another example is something like this moose. And the idea here is that these moose grow antlers that take up to 30% of all their metabolism. Now, one of the things is if you're a moose, you want to be able to communicate with other moose that might be fighting you for territory. But you don't want to give up all your territory or a mate to someone who just comes up to you and says, hi, I'm stronger, time to move over. Because if they're not, you know, you've just given up all your territory, your mate, to someone who, in fact, you could be in a fight. But when they actually fight, 
even the vic victor loses because they will injure each other so badly that they're likely to get taken down in the next fight or develop a horrible infection. So they want to avoid fighting, but they need to have this honest signal. Um, and so the idea here is that these antlers have grown so large that it's not just to be for fighting, but that it meta metabolically only the strongest ones could even hold their head up and grow them. And so it's an honest signal that they can evaluate each other in advance and so they don't have to fight. Um, and so for a minute, what I'd like to do is just you define a couple of vocabulary words that we will be using they are very helpful. When you think about the ways that you try and get information about someone else around you, there's all kinds of things you use. And I'll use the term Q for anything you might use to get information about some other being. Um, and it could be something that was intended for communication or it could just be anything else. It could be, for instance, a mosquito finds your presence by the CO2 you give off. Now, you don't intend to do this. And so we'll use the term evidence for cues that were not meant for communication because you didn't evolve to tell mosquitoes you're there, but you give off CO2 for other reasons. That's some information that they use. Signals are something that evolved or is consciously intended for communication and that other beings can use to pick some, some underlying quality up to understand, because so many of the things we want to know about each other or animals want to know about each other are hidden qualities. We can't see if someone else is intelligent. You can't see directly if someone, if you want to hire someone, you can't see directly if they're going to be a good employee. You know, professors cannot see directly if a student understands something. They have to, you have tests or other ways of doing it. You can't see directly if someone's in love with you. You have ways of trying to gauge that. In, you know, in, in other ways. But so we have to rely on signals. And what makes it important to make that distinction is because a signal is something whose function, purpose is for communication. If, because um, what happens if a signal becomes unreliable, if it's something that's very easy to mimic dishonestly, if you're the recipient of such an unreliable signal, at some point you never know if it's going to tell you the information you want. If a signal becomes too unreliable, it will cease to function because no one would ever believe it anymore. So signaling has a, a kind of dynamic, is that as long as there's something keeping it reliable enough, it will be listened to, it will be beneficial to the signaler because they're being believed, it will be beneficial to the recipient because they're learning something true. If a signal is very easy to cheat, it ceases over time to become used because it becomes too harmful for the receivers who get cheated too many times. But exactly where that balance is for different things can vary because some things are not that harmful. Some signals turn out to have other benefits that may be pleasant to hear or listen to or enjoyable in some other ways. So a lot of what we'll be looking at are how the dynamics of this type of signaling works. Um, you can see this sometimes in the human world. If you are trying, you know, if you set, wanted to signal, I am very wealthy. It could be very useful to have a very, very expensive car to show off your wealth with. Um, part of it, too, is that it's, you, you know, there's all kinds of things you could do. You could also just sit down and take, you know, $100 bills and burn them. But, you know, aside from the entertainment value once or twice, it's not actually that enjoyable to others. So one of the things that's also useful about something like the expensive car is that it is something that other people may want to pay attention to and choose to notice. One, if you're driving down the street and it's a Lamborghini, it's very loud. You know, it could be quieter, but it's certainly designed to get your attention. It can be pleasurable to get a ride in it. So there's other pieces that go along with why particular designs work that way. It's Valentine's Day coming up this weekend, and so there's all kinds of signaling for gifts. Um, part of which might be signaling economically, I am going to give you an expensive gift. It might be signaling, I understand your taste very well. There's an um, economics article that shows up every year at Christmas called The Deadweight Loss of Christmas by you know, a very Scrooge-like economist who's saying, you know, we lose billions of dollars in the economy every year because people give gifts that nobody wants. And so if everybody just gave gift certificates, or better yet, just stopped giving gifts, it would be so much better for the economy because we wouldn't be wasting all this money. But 
part of that waste in gift giving is the cost of being able to show off that you know something about that other person's taste. That it's a way of saying, there's lots of complicated messages in gift giving, but one of the things that they miss there is that a lot of that waste is the inherent cost, the risk that you are taking in saying, I'm guessing what you want, and if you don't make a mistake, being able to give something that strongly signals, I understand you and I know what you like. Um, in, so we were talking about the evolution of communication. So those are examples of costly signals. And one of the reasons that they work is that there's a, a sort of basic equation in signaling theory, which is that a signal will be reliable if it is affordable to be given, because if it's not affordable to give. And by affordable, I don't just mean by money. It could be in terms of any kind of resource, time, energy, whatever. But if it's affordable to give, um, by honest signalers, but prohibitively expensive for ones who don't have the quality it's, that it's giving, it will be reliable. Um, conventional signals, which are used a lot by humans and also by many other social animals, though research in that is still very um, primitive, are signals where it, there's nothing inherent in the form of the signal itself that makes it honest, but there's different social things that keep it honest enough to function. So for instance, it is you can buy siren lights on the web. It's very easy. They are a conventional signal of being a policeman. You could put them on your car and um, I already spent yesterday being stuck in San Francisco traffic, and you could just make your way through traffic really fast and easily. <laughs> but it turns out that we have a lot of social sanctions. In this case, you know, they're government-imposed sanctions, and you will get fined and sent to jail if you impersonate a policeman. So it's not that the signal is so hard to give and that there's something magical about being a policeman that lets you do that, but society frowns upon it and makes it too costly. So that can exist within, so it's not necessarily the form. If you have social sanctioning, you can have conventional signaling, which is one of the ways, certainly human language is a form, not everything about the language, but the fact that you know I can say, um, there are 10,000 people in this room. It's easy, as easy for me to say that as there are, what, 45 people in this room. The words are themselves conventional signals. It's, it's not any harder to say something that's not true, but we have social sanctions around things where they're difficult. Now, in the human world in particular, there's another way in which signaling um, has evolved and certainly makes things and, and has advanced certain, uh, certainly our inventiveness quite a bit, which is that we are beyond almost any other, certainly well beyond any other animal, very, very good at faking things. And one of the things, if you start looking at signals and honesty that's really amazing is how it's almost impossible to think of a signal that you could give as a human being that is it valuable to give, that, you know, that being believed to do this is of value, that there's not some way to fake. So we've invented cubic zirconia to go along with diamonds. Um, you know, it turned out once, you know, for any of you who know the... Um, the history of sun tanning, the, like the whole idea that once all the jobs moved into the factories, it became um, valuable to be able to show off that you have a tan, you had the leisure to be out in the sun. And so once tanning became something, being tan said, I have high status, I look really good, I've been on vacation, we invented machines to be able to give you a tan. We have spray tanners, we have bronzers, we have tanning booths. It's just an extraordinary industry of being able to fake the look of having gone on a beautiful vacation without actually enjoying the vacation, but having the look of it. Um, we have, you know, we value being able to signal that you are youthful with, you know, beautiful youthful skin. And we have a monthly billion dollar cosmetic surgery industry to fake that. We, um, we have elocution lessons. This is um, the Pygmalion, sort of the original Eliza, um, giving elocution lessons where if it's important to signal that you were born in a different place or of a different social class than you were, and, you, and to be able to signal, I speak as if I grew up in this other way. So there are just many, many, many ways that um, 
we do this. The other thing to keep in mind, and we're going to get to robots in a second, for those of you who are thinking, like, where did the robots go? Um, but there is that hint in the word, in this, this is Eliza. Um, if the receivers don't mind the deception, and then they don't impose any cost, you can have a system where you have quite a lot of, and part of the problem in talking about this is that as a society, we're, we're very against lying. There are not very many good terms for things being not true that are not highly pejorative. Um, but another, way, another piece that's important to keep in mind is not all lies are harmful. And in fact, there are a lot of lies that are fairly important. If you, um, for any of you who have children, or I mean, all of you have been children, um, or are around it, one of the things that we do when you have a, like a two-year-old or a three-year-old is you have to teach them not to tell the truth because that's what toddlers do all the time is they blurt out really uncomfortable things. They stare at people they shouldn't be staring at. They tell you how much they hate you know, the gift that their grandmother just gave them. Everything, you just spend a lot of time saying, no, you have to say that like, I like this. No, you really cannot stare at that person. And no, you can't say you don't like this. You can't say, you know, why, you know, why does your nose look so funny? No, 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 you know, you have to pretend something else. So there's a tremendous amount of not being truthful that is not just, you know, okay, but without it, society simply could not function. You know, if you had a world in which everyone said the truth all the time, we would be, at, you know, at war all the time. If you think of a person who never, who always tells the truth all the time, that is someone who has a very hard time fitting into society. Um, and so what, one of the things to remember about signaling is it's this kind of economic system. And it goes back and forth. And a lot of it is about not saying that deception is right or wrong, but where is the harm coming from? And there's two key places. One is that the receiver may be harmed by being deceived. But there's also harm that can come to the giver of an honest signal when that signal becomes overrun by dishonest signalers. But in the absence of harm there, you can have a lot of things where deception is either required or certainly we can go along with quite a bit of unreliability. So now we will move back into the world of, of robotics. One of the things that was interesting to me when I was looking at robots, um, I think most of you are probably familiar with the Turing test, but when you think about it, um, so just a quick review. So this is Turing's paper from 1950 that was published in a philosophy journal. And in this, he wrote that he was at first going to address the question of, can a machine think? And then he immediately says, well, that question is just completely meaningless. We can never figure that out. We don't, we don't really have a definition of what it means to think. So instead, where he's going to consider the substituting for that question, the idea of an imitation game. It's this parlor game. He says, you know, there's this game. You have someone behind a curtain. Um, they send messages written back and forth. Um, and the idea is, you know, they, everyone, they're all going to claim they're women, but we don't know if it's a man or a woman. You try and figure out by the way they answer questions. Is this really a woman or someone pretending to be a woman? Let's substitute a machine. It'll type the text back and forth. You have to remember, this is 1950. There's no you know, there aren't actually machines yet that did this, but it will send the messages back and forth. And if once the machine can fool us into thinking it's human, we'll have to think of it as thinking. And he predicted that this would happen by in 50 years, which would be the year 2000. 2000 came and went. We didn't quite have it, but we're getting very close to this today. Now, there's a lot of really interesting things about this paper. Um, one is that is the whole question of whether this is a useful substitution for the idea of can a machine think. For the purposes of this talk, the piece I'm really interested in is that an entire kind of branch of AI has been from the beginning based on the problem of can we deceive people into thinking that this computer is a human being? Um, and what does it mean to do that? Um, we'll talk a little bit later about Eliza for those of you who know it, yes, you know, there were very early responses that said, well, we could kind of fake this fairly easily. Um, how well computers can do with this is actually a fairly ambiguous problem. There's a yearly test um, contest that's run. It's not the most respectable contest, um, but there's a very funny piece. Marvin Minsky, who um, passed away a couple of weeks ago, 
um, tried to get Loebner to take this prize down. If you go to the, Lo the page of the Loebner Prize, which is a basically Turing test competition every year, it says co-sponsored by Marvin Minsky because he had said that he would pay $100 to anyone who could get Loebner to quit doing that. And Loebner wrote back and said, well, I'm going to quit doing this once someone wins the prize. And so that would satisfy Marvin's requirements. So Marvin is going to pay $100, and now he's a co-sponsor of my prize. But that aside. Um, so this is, so it's this, but what's interesting about this, it's a test that's done every year, and they have a bunch of judges, and people come up with their chatbots, and they try and convince the judges that they're human. There's actual humans that are also trying to be human and talk with the judges. So far, no one has won even this fairly limited version. I, I don't remember, it's like a 20 minute test or something. Um, but each year, one thing does a little better. And what's actually interesting is while none has been unanimously fooled all the judges, every year, some of them fool some of the judges some of the time. And the other part is the judges are not always good at noticing who is human. So a lot of times they've judged humans to be com um, computers. So while this notion of, of, so even in a place where people are trying very hard to think, is this a human or a computer, in a limited spot, the idea of language as a signal of being human is highly problematic. So now you see where something like this kind of fits in, into the signaling system is one of the other pieces that's important in thinking about sort of the economics of, of honesty is that there's a cost to evaluating the quality you're trying to assess. And it's, in signaling theory, it's called um, the, the, it's the assessment cost, basically. And so here they're saying, we're going to give you 15 minutes of your time and you think about it. But in normal, everyday interactions, we don't always have that time. If it's not that important for you to know whether you're dealing with a human or a machine or not, you might not want to sit there and interview it for 15 minutes trying to get that question that's going to fool you into thinking it. So part of it is many things like this, if you had enough time, if you have infinite resources, you can invest them into making those distinctions, but if you don't care or, or you have very little time, you may have to make that trade-off that says, I can't afford that assessment, I can't afford to be fooled, so I'm just going to let this issue go. Um, and so in real life, a lot of what we are dealing with now is being on the human side. Remember I said there were two groups that kind of lose out when a signal becomes somewhat deceptive. And one of the groups is the honest signaler. And so one of the things that you're used to when you um, see a CAPTCHA is essentially you are paying the cost of having to signal you are human. Now, 30 years ago, nobody sat there and thought, wow, I'm going to have to like prove continuously that I am a human being in order to read a newspaper. <laughs> but that's sort of what we're left at today because of the ubiquity of, machi uh, of machines, or in this case, spam bots, that pretend to be human. Um, and it's interesting that the first really ambiguously human bot was something called the Zuma bot back in Usenet. It, this came out in like 1994. So Usenet was sort of the big, the first big online conversational space, and people talked about all these different topics. And all of a sudden, that. that there started to be, and some of it was argumentative, but it was all humans, and it was a very, very robust, lively um, conversational space. And there started to be these rants that were denying that there had ever been an Armenian genocide. But they would turn up in groups that were talking about Turkey, they would turn out in groups that were talking about Armenia. And at first, someone thought it was just some really obnoxious person doing this, so they were doing it quite a bit. And then someone noticed that we were responding to anything that referred to turkey. Like, we had turkey for Thanksgiving. Anywhere on Usenet, suddenly there'd be this rant about the Armenian genocide coming after it. People were saying, this is a, a robot. Nobody had seen this kind of bot actually before. But the problem that it engendered was once you had something like this, very quickly you started to realize that any time people got into some kind of discussion and somebody wanted to accuse someone of um, not thinking, they would say, you're a bot. 
we know that you're a bot and trying to get other people to think they weren't real. And so you could see this changing, that tenor of the communication once suddenly the idea that the person you're talking with might not be a human being became an actual real possibility. And so all of the ones we've been talking about so far have been text things where the issue is saying, are you actually human? But now we're, we're moving. So, and that's certainly a growing phenomenon. But now we're sort of moving into this other world of the cute robots. Now here, no one is saying that they are going to be mistaken for a human being. Um, you know, even in Turing's paper in 1950, the reason he gave for framing it as this imitation game and this parlor game was, you know, there was, he said, you know, it's, it's not going to happen in any foreseeable future that we're going to be able to build robots that are going to physically make you mistake them for a human being. But, you know, we'll see what, you know, synthetic biology does with that. But um, for the moment, we can say that the physical issues are not so much the question of whether the thing you're dealing with is human, but partly whether it, it, whether, whether it is sentient, um, whether it cares about you in some way. And a lot of things are a lot more ineffable and hard to put our hands on than this question of, you know, is the text thing human or not? And um, so one of the, the questions is not just, is it sentient, but when do we care? There's a lot of big questions here that aren't just, can we judge what is sentient, but also, you know, in this realm, we can see what the signal is. It's, you know, it's cute, it has these big eyes, but the question is, what is it that we're trying to care about with these different features? Um, so one of the things that's fairly ubiquitous in a lot of these robots is they're adorable. And, you know, if you look at this, it you know, has these big eyes, it has a little chin, it has a big forehead, it looks like a baby. And there's a, there's a very interesting work that was done by a woman named Leslie Zebrowitz. She writes about the baby face overgeneralization problem. And the issue here is that um, it's very, very important for us to think to treat things that look like babies well. Because if we don't treat baby, actual babies well, we will not, I mean, right now the human, human world is not really dealing with a uh, underpopulation problem, but we evolved in a state where that was a problem. Um, and so if you think about a baby, a baby is not an inherently pleasant being. They cry, they spit up on you, they pee. Like they're, they're just like, they're not very pleasant. So if we had not evolved to look at like little baby faces and just think, oh my God, it's so cute. It just threw up on me. It's so adorable. <laughs> yeah, you would just say, you know, why don't we just leave you under a rock over there? So our response to, to baby faces and things that are babyish is, is very, very, very strong. Wrong. And, um, and so part of it, so a lot of designers have noticed this. And so the baby, so the thing is, we respond to babies, we cut them a lot of slack. We have very low expectations for their intelligence, but we want to take care of them. We, we tend to ascribe fairly innocent motives to them, et cetera. And so when things have that look, one of the things that Deb Leslie Zebrowitz in her research isn't talking about robots. I mean, her work is very interesting because she's talking about how we see other people because this also goes through to adults that it turns out that you know some of us happen to have little chins or big eyes or big foreheads or very round faces. Some people as adults end up looking more like babies for reasons that have nothing to do with their personality whatsoever. And some look more the opposite of that. And it turns out that the people who look the least like babies, for instance, are seen as much more authoritative and more intelligent. On the other hand, if they're in trial, they are much more likely to be found guilty under the same circumstances. So in court, you're at a disadvantage if you don't look like a baby, but if you're actually trying to get a job or a prom promotion, you may be at a great disadvantage just because of the bone structure of your face. And so, you know, obviously this is something that lots, lots of designers have had. You can, you know, we can sell cars with this, et cetera. So the commercial world is full of things that look like babies. Um, but so 
And then we, we have things like we have a lot of toys and they elicit a lot of warmth. I mean, if you look at this bear now, think about like abandoning this bear somewhere. Like if this was your bear, you would feel like you take care of it. You might you know, say goodbye to it when you put it on a shelf. It's very easy for us even without adding in any element of robotics or intelligence or anything, for us to think about objects that have this kind of cuteness to them as sentient sort of beings with feelings and elicit that sort of caretaking from us. Um, so one of the questions, though, is what happens when it's even more interactive? Now, one of the things you might notice here is that this is a smart bear. Oh, you're not getting to see this because it's showing to it. But it, this only has two stars, by the way. So some of them may be more <laughs> successful than others. We are we're having this talk because we're at the cusp of these things being successful. But right now, a lot of them are sitting there in that uncanny valley where they act a little sentient-like, but just enough to be really irritating, it turns out. But, um, but here, where once you have toys like this, where the interaction comes from, this, from that being, a child who's playing with a stuffed bear really knows that when that bear talks back to them, that at some level they have made up that interaction. But now you have toy bears that look really cute, but they actually respond to you. So the idea that this is another being outside of your having given it imaginary sentience is much stronger. So one of the questions, for instance, we want to be thinking about here is, you know, here's that other kind of honest signaler, you know, the pet guinea pig. But now all of a sudden, how does, like, for instance, one of the questions, these, these are questions we don't know the answers to yet, but how does it change if you grow up in a world where your pet toys talk to you, ask you about your day, they remember your, their interactions with you, et cetera, and very friendly, they know your name and everything, does it make something like your guinea pig seem dumber and duller and less interesting? Because it doesn't know your name and it doesn't really care that you came from, come from school. You know? So is this sort of changing our model of how we deal with things, sort of the interactions with other non-human things and changing our expectations in some kind of um, subconscious way? Um, just one other note about this neo this neoteny, which is the, the term for things that tend to look kind of babyish. Um, these are foxes. It's a little hard to see in, in here because it's light. But these are foxes from a really interesting experiment that was done in Russia over about a 50-year period where um, the actual thing was to actually prove um, some other genetics point um, because it was the Russia of um, non-Mendelian non genetics. But... What the experimenters were doing was they, they took a bunch of foxes and they kept breeding from every generation just the friendliest ones. They weren't trying to breed ones that looked more childlike. They had a set of very strict protocols they used about like how does it approach you, um, how does it feed, how, you know, how shy it is. They were looking for ones that did not express anger and ones that seemed a little fearful of humans. And they just kept breeding them, breeding them. They did like many generations of it. And it's apparently they're still breeding them. What they ended up with was not only very friendly foxes who wag their tails, have all kinds of very dog-like behaviors. But what they didn't expect was their faces got shorter, their chins got smaller, their eyes got bigger. So a whole number of other neotenous traits went along with friendliness. So there's some, it turns out there's a lot of very interesting cross genetics about it. But just now we'll go back to looking at fake cute neotenous animals. So this is Paro, who is a interactive, very cute seal. And he's made in Japan. He's about $1,600. So apparently he responds. He's very responsive. People like it very much. So one of the things to think about in how we judge, because here they start to be things that are, unless you kind of know what's going on inside, very hard for you to make the sense that this is a machine that you're dealing with, as opposed to some kind of sort of sentient, responsive being. Now. Um, the framework that they use Paro in is nursing homes, where they say it turns out that dementia patients um, respond really well to having animals with them. And it calms them down, et cetera. 
but dementia patients aren't really good at taking care of animals. So you, you don't actually want, it's not actually kind to an animal, let alone to the patient, to leave them there. But you can give them this artificial seal, and it will purr, and it will nuzzle up to them, and it will sort of murmur little seal nothings at them. And it will calm patients down who are really agitated. So it seems here that, you know, the idea of having something like this, these are dementia patients, they're, you know, you're basically in a palliative care situation. It seems like it's a benefit. Um, but when we start thinking about replacing an actual pet with these for, say, children, it seems a little like a, a somewhat different um, equation that we're making of saying, here you're going to lavish your affection on this pet. This is, this is not my words, this is the words of the, the site. Um, Neko Venus uses the latest in sensor robotic technology to create a truly interactive pet that reacts to your stimuli when you pet it, <coughs> including realistic meowing, blah, 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 blah. She even raises her paw in the way that only a cat does. Um, so um, this is, you know, it's, it's, this is something that do you feel, you know, one of the things to think of is like, do you feel that this is an adequate substitution for a pet? What is it, you know, what, and it makes us question, what, what is it that we are doing with pets? I mean, there, it's a kind of funny phenomenon that humans have pets. You sort of think, so does, you know, if you're trying to think, I'm not going to give an answer here about what are, what are the ethics or desirability of this, but it does make us, it gives us another framework for thinking about what is it about these relationships with these other beings that um, that's desirable. So here's you know here's the real cat. So but you also see now the neoteny in you know this is an actual cat in an actual cat's face. But part of the piece that's also interesting with it is um, for me is when you are lavishing affection on a artificial animal. So you know they they've looked at things like how those particularly with the dementia patients. What is it that makes it so nice to hold this animal? Um, oxy, there's a couple of things, but sort of the simplest sort of neuroscience side of it is that um, oxytocin is the, it's sort of called the love hormone, but it's one of the hormones that gives us sort of the Kickstarter that humans need to cooperate. And a lot of, you know, if, if you're familiar with love game theory, there's the problem of how do you get people to cooperate in the beginning? You sort of need this like sort of extra oomph to get it to work. And it turns out that um, hormonally, there's a lot of ways that cooperating brings us pleasure. And it turns out that being around a pet is a very um, pleasurable experience. It's sort of, you know, you don't usually, most of us don't actually need a neuroscientist to tell you that. But it also turns out that it has the same effect on the animal. Um, in particular, the stud a recent study showed that it really has a big effect on dogs, that being petted and loved is really, really releases a lot of um, oxytocin in dogs, less on cats, with the important caveat, it's my cat, my daughter, my cat, um, with the important caveat that when they were testing the cats, cats are very territorial animals, and they were testing them in a lab. And so you can bring your dog into a lab, and he's just like your wag his tail, and be like, oh, you took me on an outing. You bring a cat into a lab, and it's completely freaked out. So the fact that they responded at all is probably a sign that, you know, if you had tested them at the home where they're in charge, they would have done much better. But the important point here is that one of the questions it brings up is how much in our relationships do we care about the experience of the other? Because if you say, well, I can hold this fake pet and love it and it makes me feel good, it's about saying I'm interested only in the form of the signal, that it's sort of loving me back. I don't really care whether there is love back to be had. Whereas in the case of a relationship with an actual animal, there is at least in some cases the fact that when you are sitting here and petting it and everything, it's not just that it's purring and it makes you feel better or it's you know, doing whatever dogs do and making you feel better. It, you actually are making another being happy. And so what is, you know, that's the piece that the robotic animal kind of leaves out. <clears throat> and so part of it is it brings up interesting questions about how do we see all kinds of relationships like that. 
you know, we live in a world where a lot of our interactions are within a service economy. So I know a lot of you are doing, you know, research in, in different types of economic models for different, um, for different forms of sort of Uber-like services, et cetera. And once we start thinking about what is this remark the marketplace for labor, an enormous amount of the labor that goes on, particularly in a service economy, is the labor of saying, I am going to act as if I like you very much. You know, you are going to go into this restaurant and people love being told, oh yes, that was a really, really good choice. Oh, it's so good to see you here again. Now, we are, we are paying people to do this, to make us feel good. Those of us who have worked as waitresses know some of the time you think that. Some of the time you think, I hope they give me a tip. This is the sort of table that never does. I'm going to be really pleasant, but they better tip me. It's not quite the relationship we're seeing. At some level, we're aware of this. So part of the signaling question, as we're thinking about robots, is how much do we want to be fooled? In, you know, in general, and it raises interesting questions, not just about the robotic world, but I think it also makes us rethink our relationship with a lot of sort of animals around us and how we think about people and how do we want to be thinking about them and whether, you know, this is something we want to sort of reframe or um, rethink how we um, deal with this. And it happens that even sort of really even met minute levels of how we think about language. Um, there was a, this is from a, uh, there was a headline, um, I don't know if you can see this, the cow would just, get, okay, you can't really read that, but um, this is from a headline from the New York Times last week, is that a cow escaped from a, uh, from a slaughterer and ran through the streets of Queens before it was captured again. And the New York Times ran a headline saying the cow you know, who escaped from the slaughterhouse, blah, 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 blah. And um, then they got a letter from Peter Singer, the animal rights activist, saying, this is really great. We're really, really happy that you used who to refer to a cow instead of that. And then it turned out that the New York Times has a whole um, guideline. They've, their AP guideline is to call an animal it, not he or she, unless its sex has been mentioned or it has been personalized with a name. The dog was lost, it howled. Marmaduke Duke was lost, he howled. And so even at the simple level of, of grammar and very little things in terms of how we refer to another, we make these distinctions between things that we think about as a thing. Because if you think about the cow because it turns out the first thing that happened to this cow was it was returned to the slaughterhouse. And there's a big difference in how the sentence sounds, the, like the cow that escaped, it was sent to the slaughterhouse versus um, it turns out the cow wasn't even a cow, it was a he. Um, so they had a lot of little mistakes here, but we'll call it a she for this example. So, but the cow who escaped, she was sent to the slaughterhouse. That sounds really cruel. So even at the level of pronouns, how we think about these others um, has a huge impact on what our ethical sense is about how they can be treated. Um, this is sort of a very early uh, example of a, so, is there anyone who does not know what this is? Okay, great. So it's, a, it's Tamagotchi, you know, it was the keychain pet. Um, the American version was made nice to be for, uh, you know, American sensitivities. You know, this is a pet, you were supposed to feed it, you know, click on it to feed it, clean it, clean it, you know, do all these little things for it. Um, the Japanese version was a little harsher. If it died, it died. Your Tamagotchi was dead. The American one would come back to life after, you know, 10 minutes or something. But the point that I wanted to make here was that um, how we frame it, so think, about taking, think about a kid who has a Tamagotchi and now you are at your aunt's house for dinner. And, you know, every few minutes you get up to go tend to your this Tamagotchi. If you think about this as a computer game, you're being really rude. There's all these other people around you and you're being rude. You keep leaving the table because you have this game that you have to play and you're like privileging this like little keychain object over actual people and that says like really bad things about like what technology is doing to our relationship with humans. On the other hand, if you think about this as, okay, it's a pet. We're gonna think we know it's not really a pet, but this is a child and it's sort of a training pet. Then not leaving the table and letting the pet die 
seems kind of creepy. Like, you don't really want to let your child have this training pet and then tell it, like, oh, well, if there's something else you should be doing, it doesn't really matter that it didn't, didn't get fed and died. That seems like kind of a weird way to raise a child. Like, of course your child should be leaving the table to do this. So these framings are really important in terms of the sort of the lessons that we think about with these things. Um, and so now we're going to go back to the 1960s again and Eliza, not the Pygmalion Eliza, but um, the sort of computer program Eliza. And Eliza was... Um, a professor named Joseph Weizenbaum's response to Turing's paper on using language and he, uh, um, to tell you know if you're um, if a machine is intelligent, and he wrote a program and it used a very very simple parser and this is in 1965 and you can still find this running if, um, there's millions of versions of it on the web. Uh, it was a very simple parser, and it basically spat back your sentences to it and this is actually this is. Um, you know, an actual interaction with Eliza um, that I did. And one of the, th but the thing is, he framed it as saying it's a Rogerian psychologist. And um, the idea was it's a psychologist who basically, whatever you say, is going to say, well, why did you say that? What makes you think this? And so it was a framing that made a, you know, th this kind of simple sentences make sense. And so what Weizenbaum's intention in making Eliza was he wanted to show that language was not a good proxy for being a smart machine, that it was going to be very easy to build interactions that would fool people into thinking someone was human-like, that it didn't mean that it was in any way intelligent, that it just showed that the ability to carry on a conversation with text was just not a good proxy for that question whatsoever. What happened was people just loved this program. And um, his secretary apparently said, I would like you to leave the room. I am talking to this in private. Um, they really liked the idea of it being a therapist. People wrote articles saying this is the future of psychotherapy. Weizenbaum was so horrified by this that he basically left the field of computer science and spent the rest of his career warning about the dehumanizing possibilities of machines, and in particular, how dehumanizing it was that we were willing to have this type of relationship with a machine. So one piece of it was, you know, is that, you know, what is it in the relationship to a therapist? Is it better to have something like this machine that will just sort of ask you questions back? What is it that having a real human being at the other end of a therapeutic relationship bring you? Is it sort of like the waitress where you're paying someone to have a relationship with you? What if the therapist is actually sitting there thinking, oh, God, okay, this is my most tedious patient. Yes, dear? Yes, well, why, why did you do that? Would you rather be talking to a machine that might not be thinking things about you, but just being too well-trained not to let you know? So part of it is um, because of these questions, and they're still, they're actually quite real today. This is um, some contemporary research. I'm not sure if this is actually at Stanford. It may be a Stanford project elsewhere or came from a student who went off and became a professor somewhere else. But this is doing um, a robotherapist in interface for the Veterans Administration where the idea is they say, well, we need so many people who need therapy and you know, we don't have enough therapists. We're really going to do, you know, we're going to do machine-based therapy. It's very um, useful. And so part, of the, so part of the questions here is, you know, is this, you know, is this, a good future to be building? Is this a, a useful way of doing therapy? If a machine is, says the exact same things that a human being would say in response, is there any different from this? You know, is this a case? Or what are the cases where what we really care about is the internal experience of the person or animal or thing that we are relating to or the existence even, of an internal experience, and when do we just care about the words or the meowing or the purring or whatever that we are getting back from them. And where, you know, as human beings, we really, really care about other, what others think of us. So that experience of what is going on in the minds of others is something that is really important to us. We buy a lot of self-help books trying to 
help us make a better impression on others. And so, you know, I think what it, a lot of what Weizenbaum was worried about was, our, you know, is the increasing um, common, commonness of things that come to us with the impression that they are thinking about us and caring about us in ways that it's very hard for a human being to do. Because, for instance, a machine can be infinitely patient. A machine can remember an infinite number of details about you in a way that your actual friends cannot do. Does this start to change how we deal with other human beings in reality? Um, the other side, too, is, you know, a more benign version of the why did the secretary send Weizenbaum out of the room was maybe it wasn't maybe she wasn't really relating it to it as a quasi human being at all. Maybe it was just like a, a quiz. Maybe it was just sort of that type of interface or an interaction, or like the way we might say, you know, dear diary, um, and and sort of confess all kinds of things to some kind of inaccurate, um, not inac inanimate object. And so, speaking of diaries, though. I think this brings up one other issue that's is important to keep in mind about interactions with the machine intelligence. Is this is a, a great quote from the Harry Potter books. This is um, the diary that Ginny confided in, but it turned out that its brain, that it behind it was being controlled by Voldemort. And Ginny said, Mr. Weasley flabbergasted, haven't I taught you anything? What have I always told you? Never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. And so now we have Barbie, where you have a Barbie that you give to your child, and it can think, and it, th it can seem like it's thinking, it can talk, it can interact, and, but your, its brain is in the cloud, or you know, in Mattel. It is a wirelessly connected doll, it's for sale now. It's wirelessly connected, it records what your child is saying, and ships that information up to Mattel, which sends it back information about how best to respond to it. Um, and so part of this is you get a highly interactive doll. It's not always clear here, you know, to the extent that this is entirely machine-based. They mean to do it. So part of it is it's learning how to be more machine-based. Some of it, maybe there's humans doing this. But it's also the whole side of what goes on with that information. You are interacting with someone whose brain you cannot see, but you feel as sort of the simple, innocent doll sitting here. It could be, you know, the, all of the interactions go off to perhaps a marketing department. What happens if it overhears, you know, overhears something? What if it overhears the parents talking about something illegal or whatever? There's all kinds of pieces like that about thinking um, here. It's where does the thing that you are speaking with keep its mind? Um, there have been other sort of recent issues. I don't know how many of you know that Ashley Madison scandal from it was like a year ago. So Ashley Madison, for those who don't know, it was a dating site that was sort of this notorious site because it um, built itself as the dating site for married people who wanted to have affairs. And and one of the things that was really interesting about it was that there were like there were a lot of men on the site, but there were also lots and lots of women. It was kind of surprising because people didn't think there were that many women who would go to a site like this. But it turns out there were tons of them. Then Ashley Madison got hacked, and so at first people thought the big Ashley Madison scandal was going to be it had all of these guys' names and that they were on the site for cheating on your wife. But then it also turned out once and the hackers just released the full database of. Um, all the users of this site, turned out like the men were real, but the women were not. That like there were almost no actual women on the site. They were almost all bots. And so all these men had been paying, and it was a fairly expensive site, had been paying and paying, but what they had been interacting with were fake human beings. Um, so that brings up one other piece of it is that in from the signaling side, remember we said that there's sort of this expense of being fooled, and there's also um, the receiver um, assessment costs. But one of the questions here, too, is how motivated are you to make that assessment? So here, in some ways, we have a, a set of people who might have been fairly motivated to be deceived. And that's you know one other piece here is, and that's another piece with the cuteness and the disarmingness, is 
as the recipient of, of that kind of affection, whether it's you know, Ashley Madison or a very cute robot, how much does the experience of it make you into a kind of willing receiver of something that's not um, actually true? And then um, just one final design piece. Oh, you had a question? Um, so I had heard about that, but were they actually bots, or did they pay people to kind of act and write back to? They were mostly programmatic, um, and there were—I think there were a huge number of them—and they had. I mean, if they weren't, you know, strictly speaking, they weren't sort of all individual software agents. I think there were a series of scripts where they scraped images um, from both. A, few people who had submitted there, but just from all over the web, built up these profiles, and then they just had a lot of scripted interactions. This American Life story recently, where there was these people would pay all this money to subscribe to essentially be pen pals with these women, and it was just a small, it was actually a guy who wrote most of the letters, and he, and he went to jail for a long time for fraud, and it was kind of a similar setup, yeah. except with no plots. Yeah. So, yeah, basically bots are putting out of work all the people who are doing fraudulent human things like that. So, so James had mentioned earlier that he was at an economics talk the other night that I think probably opened with this slide of, of Rod Brooks with Baxter, but it's just one last sort of cute robot and one last point I wanted to leave with here, just in particular from a design perspective too, because... Um, so this one um, is interesting because one of the things that Rod Brooks has talked about with the design of, of Baxter, also a cute faced robot, but here he, um, the cuteness is the eyes and everything are not simply to be disarmingly cute, but they're meant to be highly functional. Um, it's, there, it used to be an interface design of eyes as output. It's the use of gaze to show where am I looking. And so part of the idea here is that you, this is a robot that's going to be very, very easily trained for doing lightweight tasks, whether they are in a factory floor or ultimately in your home. And part of it is how do you have a fairly intuitive interaction with this? And that if you can see the eyes, you know, it could, you know, you could say, you know, use this thing and you could see that you can do things like refer to this because you have a very intuitive way of knowing where its attention is and things like that. And so what I wanted, just as a sort of provocation, so a lot of what I've been saying is, well, here are these pieces that are sort of fooling you into thinking that there are other things. One of the um, scenarios that he's talked about for Baxter is for things like elder care. You know, if you, you know, if you are bedridden and you need to be turned every day or you need to be changed and bathed, you can have a robot do this. And here is sort of this interesting question about care also, because there comes the question, for instance, of dignity, of where people say, you know, I find that the idea of being cared for in that sense really humiliating. You know, I don't want people to see me in this state. Whereas if the thing that is taking care of you doesn't actually have any feelings because it's not actually sentient, is this something that would maintain more dignity? But in that case, do you want it to look less like a human to remind you more that it's a machine? And so part of it is there's the issues of deception, there's the issues of self-deception, but there's also the, the questions of when is it that we want to be dealing with an interface and not. And so, you know, obviously here, I think one of the undercurrents here is like a lot of work that comes, you know, from Stanford and the immediate equation work that people always deal with machines as some kind of human being, but we, you know, we deal with chairs. We deal with almost every object we have the potential to deal with as a animate thing. But Lee Sproul um, and her colleagues did some work, again, maybe, you know, so many years ago, where they looked at how honest people were in filling out forms. They, they were like sort of these pseudo-employment forms. And they would ask things like, you know, did you ever shop, you know, did you ever steal a pencil from office supplies? But they tested it with two machines, two computers side by side. One had a face and one didn't. And what they found were people were much more honest when they were answering questions to text than they were to computers with faces. 
and their hypothesis was that we deal with other human beings in a social way. And that remember we talked about how much we really want others or really anything that we think of in that sort of human large sphere of the human context to think well of us. And so for instance, we act more nicely towards things that we think of, you know, that was one of the media equation pieces. You know, if you're, if you're critiquing a program, you'll be nicer to it on the computer, that, about it on the computer on which you ran it. But here was also you will, you will try and make a better impression on a machine that has a face, whereas you're more likely to be open and honest with a machine that reads to you clearly as being a machine. And so the questions of honesty and deception here, I think, are come ac across in many, many different realms of it. And from the designer perspective in particular, there's both ethical issues, but there's also practicality issues. And I think the signaling framing is a really useful one for forcing you, in particular, not only to understand sort of the balance between you know, where, where do you want the signal itself? Where do you care about the underlying quality? But also forcing us to think about what actually are the qualities we want to know about the other. Thank you. Well, I'll make one, one comment. I remember back when I back in my AI days 40 years ago, um, becoming aware of the human-superhuman fallacy. And I think what that issue referred to was that, well, the AIs, the AIs are down here and the humans are way up here. They're superhuman. They're all wise, all understanding. Whereas, you know, our fellow humans, this isn't a point you directly address, but, but our fellow humans are, I mean, are clearly flawed. Our psychologists are not what Weizenbaum would seek in a psychotherapist. A lot of them are troubled themselves. Our presidential candidates are troubled and have difficulties. So maybe we should be running a robot for president? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. so, yeah. Very cute one. So, so, so there you go. Well, oh, so we're a flawed race. <laughs> was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> Agree or disagree? Yes. Comment. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I had a. I wonder if you could talk a little bit to the kind of the ethical considerations as we think about these systems and whether or not these signals should should or does a designer have more ethical responsibility when they're tapping into signals that are sort of part of our evolution, part of our you know, uh, our cognitive processes that we're unaware of, uh, like you talked about, you know, uh, the, the shape of the face and whatnot, versus sort of these social signals that we've developed, you know, through our culture. And, and is there a difference there, or do you just see this as a need for us to consider these uh, uh, the same way? Um, well, I think the ones that, you know, for instance, like the, the facial ones, um, are harder for us to adjust around because they're very, very, very deep-seated. So I think you could say that there may be a greater ethical issue there because our ability to kind of adjust how we read them, A, is very small, and B, if it isn't, we probably don't really want to do that. You know, like, you know, it's like if you're, if you're surrounded by really, really cute robots, you know, is a baby girl look like a robot? Because the thing that you normally see with a face like that is a robot. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, and, and I think one of the pieces though that's also very hard in general with talking about any of the ethical issues is we can frame what the ethics are, but what I think we generally see is there will always be someone who's willing to exploit it. So it will be exploited. Part of the, part of the issue is um, how do you make it so that people understand this better? I think the, the, the other part is to how, how to get people to be more aware of the ways in which they're being subtly manipulated. So I'm wondering, so there's one thing that, so there's a lot I agree with, and one thing that I'd like to 
pick out, and I'm trying to decide if I agree with, is the extent to which robots can signal. Uh, in particular, this is sort of about how we look, where we locate the agency of this. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take the example of like, uh, uh, like at an airline at a uh, um, at an airport, uh, you're at a check-in counter. It used to be that you would always meet a person face to face when you were checking in, and like that, at some sense, uh, then got swapped out for the kiosks. Right? Mm -hmm. This is sort of that that same dynamic occurred, and. The reason why I think you know executives still like to talk to people because they can't is it's not because the the robot itself or the kiosk is like incapable of signaling. It's somehow that it's like united or someone had is the thing doing the signaling mm -hmm. through the through the choice to use a person right. versus a kiosk. So I'm just, I'm trying to struggle. I'm struggling to figure out what I think here about. You know, whether it's possible for a robot to signal, for example, if there are no costs to it, right? All like it's, it's essentially free, right? Mm -hmm. To to do anything for the robot. Okay, so there's a lot of pieces to unpack there. So one of the one of them is when you, if you start looking at these issues around signaling more closely, is you realize that one the experience of the receiver can, is quite subjective and can be very different than the intent of the signaler. So on the one hand, in terms of how you respond or your willingness to keep listening to something is all about your subjective experience and what your model is of what you think is happening. From the other side, you know, I think, one, you're correct. One of the ways also in that we fool ourselves about machine sentience is in ascribe, using verbs you know, the machine was thinking, the machine was signaling, you know, that are an issue of agency. So to some extent, even using those words to say the machine signals is a way of fooling ourselves into giving it more sentience. So though it's awkward to say United was signaling through this sort of thing. Um, but the issue of cost is that a signal can certainly be low cost. So, so the most successful signal could be something that's, and there's a whole set of signals called index signals that the issue isn't whether it's costly to be given, it's is it prohibitively costly to give it deceptively. And what you're, you're seeing here is that if you're trying to, for instance, signal I'm signaling that you are a very valued customer, and it's very easy for the robot to do that, and it knows everything about you. The fact that it's low cost doesn't make it a signal. It just makes it very easy for it to do it. So the cost is really about keeping those balances, but it, it doesn't make it more or less of a signal. So if I'm, I think I'm understanding what you're saying. If, if I'm, if computation, like one of the things that it does is it scales well, right? right? then the cost of doing something deceptively essentially goes to zero <coughs> in any case. Because if I can right. do it for you, then I can do it for anyone. Right. And is, may, is your thesis at some level that this, this will cause some sort of unusual social dynamics as this unrolls? Yes. I see. Right. So, that I, so I am working on a book on these topics. And so that's the thesis of it is that computationally we are at a inflection point in the kind of economics of honesty and that part of it is we can look at how deception has evolved you know from costly signals and animal signaling through humans and our inventiveness and everything but with computation we really are seeing some, a, a fairly large disruption coming in in communication both because of machines being able to communicate with us um, through the speed of our communication, through the level of surveillance. It's not all in the same direction, but it, it, it's certainly having a huge effect on what it means to communicate. Okay. One more? Yeah. So the, uh, the uh, problem with mental health is that sometimes you don't really want to see those cues in other people. Like, mm -hmm. for example, when somebody tells you that you're stressed, you get more stressed and there's no way to help you. So sometimes you actually have to remove those signals and machines have been actually very helpful. There's uh, robotic CBT that, that's actually being even like reimbursed by the UK and Australia. Mm -hmm. And the adoption is actually higher and the retention is a bit higher, not much higher. 
Right. And it's because they remove these signals of the human watching, uh, looking right. at you and being kind of like condescendent and really exposing that you're stressed and something that you don't really want to know because you already feel stressed and actually stresses you more. So mm -hmm. sometimes removing those signals are right. actually quite, help, quite helpful because you break the barrier that actually uh, these signals Right, create. yeah, and so and that's sort of similar to the point I was making at the end here where I said like, you know, if you feel like this is a situation that is very, like, of great indignity to be changed or, or cared for, like having a machine do it might actually be better for you. And so I think that that's part of it. It's not something where, you know, I'm not coming here to say like, robots are really bad. This is really bad for us. But I think a lot of these are very nuanced points. And understanding, because I think you, we also don't want to say, oh, any time that you enjoy it or you like it is good, because sometimes you may be paying a big cost in terms of being deceived that we're not really aware of. But there may be times here where what you're saying is the, there the experience of being in a, some kind of relationship with another human being is the problem. And getting rid of the relationship part is exactly what you want. So... Yes, but it's probably not the case that you want a machine then that's pretending to be a person. What you're probably wanting there is, is some kind of interactive feedback. It's, it's really more like an intellectual mirror than another model, than another sentient being model. All right, let's say right. do this one more time.